Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and the next episode of Game Mechanics. This is a series I haven't done in a while. This is where I take a look at various different features and mechanics in video games and analyze them from an amateur's point of view in an effort to get a better understanding of why they work, how they work, and how they help the developer convey what they want to the player. I also take a look at how they affect the player directly. Today we're going to take a look at one that's not really a mechanic per se, but one that greatly affects not only the world the developer is trying to convey, but how the player utilizes the various different tools that the developer has given to the player. So without further ado, let's take a look at stage design. Stage design is one of the core elements of any game. It often sets the tempo and pace of any game, and in many cases sets the stage of the world that the developer wishes to show the player. The level of complexity, spacing, layout, and even set pieces not only give the player a clue as to the type of game that they're playing, but what's expected for them from a gameplay aspect. It also serves as a test ground for the mastery of the various different mechanics that the developer has given the player, providing much of the challenge that the game has to offer. Each stage or world should present opportunities not only to utilize techniques and skills gained from previous encounters, but opportunities to utilize new abilities, weapons, or spells that the player has acquired as part of their progression. Good stage design will allow the player to find opportunities to approach a scenario with multiple different angles, allowing for varied playthroughs that can not only make for a more interesting experience, but increased replayability at the same time. With well, that said, let's go ahead and dig into some examples, shall we? One of the first examples I want to look at is a game I played a while back on my channel Geeks with Cash, and that game's known as Tales from Outer Space Mutant Blobs Attack. This game is a good example of stage design, ideally complementing not only the form and malleability of the main player character, but providing an interesting example of world building and platforming challenges. In this game you play as a blob who's been captured and experimented on by scientists. You find a way to break out and escape, and now you're intent on getting your revenge. This is a very interesting and unique game that not only uses clever stage design, but has a rarely used mechanic of growth as an empowering mechanic. You see, you start off as a very small blob navigating through a college dorm room. As you consume various objects in the stage, you grow in size. This allows you to navigate and open up more and more of the stage. They also go to the trouble of adding in small nooks and crannies to the stage, hiding various different collectibles and other items that can help your little blob grow big and strong. At its core, this game is a puzzle platformer, a bit of a rarity in gaming these days. You have to explore the area you're in, finding various different ways to grow to specific sizes so that you can make your way to the next area, and the stage design is laid out in such a way to promote that kind of exploration. From platforms staggered in such a way to encourage vertical exploration, to narrow gaps that take advantage of the fact that you're, well, a blob, Given it's a puzzle game, you can bet that there's a fair number of hazards from lasers, spikes, spinning saws, among many other things that can cause major damage or just kill you outright. In order to navigate these, you're given various different powers, such as telekinesis that allow you to move certain objects, to either obstruct lasers, or make insurmountable distances more manageable. The game also makes clever use of physics and stage design with momentum, not only for your character's movement, but from the objects you can use. Moving one at a fast enough speed with the telekinesis ability will keep you pressed against some objects or vault you to otherwise unreachable areas. The stage design, once you get this ability, is quite clever, since they're designed in such a way not only to require their use, but to lay them out in such a way as to make the player think about how to utilize them in the most efficient way. This allows the developer to give the player a challenge in the stage, and for the player to feel clever finding the solution that the developer intended. Another power given is Magnesis. I know it sounds odd, but it allows you to push and pull your way through the stage. Now, we've talked about this in games that focus on this before as their primary game mechanic, but this one has it just as an additional movement option, and it gets added into the stages. Glowing purple pipes will allow you to either attach to them or push off of them using the opposing polarity. Some stages even require you to both pull yourself toward and push yourself away between spikes on either side heightening the sense of tension and giving the player a rather unique obstacle to handle due to the way the mechanics are handled themselves. The player also gets one other ability, in flight, both controlled and burst. Why would you have both flight and magnesis in a stage, you ask? Wouldn't you always prefer flight? Therein lies the art of the stage design in the game. Each mechanic provides a unique challenge and mechanic for the player to utilize, giving a different feel and flow to the game. 
In fact, most of the later levels not only make use of all three of these mechanics, but also the growth mechanic, so that by the end of each stage you feel like a huge monster that's just maneuvering in a number of alien ways and absorbing everything in your path. It's a very unique design and exercise in not only mechanics, but in stage design that makes for a really unique gameplay experience. Let's look at another example. Let's say a game like Mirror's Edge. Now, this is kind of a unique game that focuses on movement, flow, and color to kind of direct the player. Let's take a look. In this game, you play a character named Faith, who's fighting against a tyrannical government regime. This game is all about movement and flow, and the world definitely reflects that. The whites and blues in the stage are a stark contrast to the bright red of the objects that you can actually interact with in order to navigate the rooftops and buildings of the world itself. This is done intentionally. It makes useful objects stand out in such a way as to keep the tempo of the game going so that the player can clearly see them. Skills are also in play here. There are skills for movement, combat, and gear, all of which will give you advantages, but the two most interesting to us today is the movement and gear sections. The reason these are so important is that they affect the most the way you interact with the world slash stage around you. Through this you can wall run, swing around and off of objects, climb faster, coil up, and get over objects and slide for extended periods of time. All these alter not only how you interact with the environment, but how it has to be designed not only to make them useful, but also fun and engaging. The game also has to be balanced to handle these additions as well, in particular the world around the player. What I mean by this is, a clever developer and world designer needs to place rewards in the world for having these kinds of abilities. Those can range from easier traversal, hidden easter eggs, linear escape routes, or just trickier, more rewarding paths and angles to take, giving the player far more flexibility than they would otherwise have in the game. It adds flavor, complexity, and interest into the world. It makes it more alive and interesting for the player. At this point, we've talked a lot about how stages should be designed around the character. It provides a playground for all the abilities the player gets so they can use them in fun and unique ways. What we haven't talked about is the stage or world as a character. Because make no mistake, the world the character is in says as much about any story mannerisms or abilities that you give the player as anything else. It provides context, not only to what life might be like in this world you're in, it can also provide context as to why someone might learn the skills or in cases evolve the way the main character did to survive and even thrive in the environment you find yourself in. They can pull you into the experience so much easier than any abilities. When worked in conjunction with those abilities and set pieces, they allow the player to feel more like a part of the world. It increases the immersion, engagement, and investment in any given game that you're going to pick up. Take our first example. The stylization is much like the old 1960s sci-fi movies, with the mysterious creature being experimented on until he, she, it escapes. What follows is a grander and grander stage design that not only tests those abilities, but show you the viewpoint into more of the world, be it a college campus, a small town that the college is in, or even, comically, the moon during one of the first times that they try to rid themselves of you and so forth and so on. It plays out much like an old school alien monster film with all the right trappings to make you feel like you are that monster going on a rampage. It helps pull you in and makes it all the more believable and ridiculous as you play through the game. In our second example, much of the game takes place on buildings, in particular rooftops and offices. The character spends most of their time traversing a large city, which is an optimal environment for someone who uses parkour to get around. The buildings making up the sprawling city go on for as far as the eye can see, making you feel like you can never escape from it. On the surface, it looks calm and peaceful, though. Very little crime presents itself, and it has a facade of legitimacy. Under the surface, the government controls the media and all facets of life. What you experience in this world is intended to show the duplicity, a calm, peaceful outer shell wrapped over a war that's going on just under the surface, or in this case, the building sewers, storm drains, and anywhere you can find a bolt hole to escape. Now let's take a moment and step back and look at everything that we've kind of covered and see how this affects the stage design. One, character shape can and should affect the world design. If your character can climb on walls, manipulate shapes, or have any other odd characteristics, that should affect your stage or world design. Two, stages should reflect the world and atmosphere. They help build the world and convey things that no story could ever possibly tell. Three, the stage should provide plenty of use for any and all abilities given to the player. 
opening up new routes, or speeding up existing ones. The best stage is one that can challenge the player to find a new or faster routes. Try new builds and experiment with it in new and interesting ways. Now before we wrap up this video, I want to take a look at at least one other type of stage design. That's one that's been built on for years. It's the Metroidvania stage design. This type of design dates all the way back to the original Metroid game, putting the player into a seemingly open world barred only by the abilities of weapons that the player has or has not acquired yet. As the player obtains new abilities or weapons, more and more the world is opened up. This makes the game not only more open-ended where the player can go in the world, but unlocks new areas and paths, possibly shortcuts to new areas. These can be some of the trickiest types of games along with full open worlds to design. They have to be open enough to keep the player engaged for the duration, have just enough direction that the player has an idea of where to go if they stray off the beaten path, which they should be encouraged to and rewarded for doing so. Now I know you might be thinking, what do you mean by rewarded? Well, this can mean a lot of things. In some games, like the 2016 Doom, you could find collectibles, hidden retro areas, or even obtain weapons earlier than the progression would normally allow. However, they can be almost anything from cosmetics, extra story bits that you might otherwise miss, optional bosses, extra lives, health boons, or even just fun easter eggs that developers put in for the curious who seek out the areas less traveled. These kinds of rewards can also make the stages and worlds the developer makes more memorable and encourage people to go back and revisit games just to find those hidden areas. So with all this said and done, what are some of your favorite worlds or stage designs? Why do you hold them in such high esteem? Are there other types of world designs or ideas I didn't cover here that you'd like to see covered? Let me know in the comments. And while you're there, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, and until next time, happy gaming.